Friends, grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Psalm 23 is a promise. It's one of the best cherished uh, passages in all the scripture. And the reason for that is because of this promise it contains. This is a promise from the Lord to be your shepherd. And because the Lord is your shepherd, you are well taken care of. You are provided for. You lack nothing. And over the past several Sundays, or several messages, we have been seeing why it is that we lack nothing when this Lord is our shepherd. We lack nothing because the Lord has already answered our most fundamental need our need to be forgiven. The Lord who is our shepherd has laid down his life to atone for our sins and therefore our sins are forgiven. He brings us to green pastures and still waters where he nourishes our souls and he himself is the righteous path on which we travel. So as we live by faith in Jesus, we are living in his righteousness. We are living out of his life. And in the process, we are instructed by his word, conformed into his likeness. So when verse 3 talks about the shepherd leading us in paths of righteousness, it's pretty much saying the same thing that Paul would say in Colossians 2. As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And that prepares us for what we're about to read today in verse 4. Psalm 23 verse 4 is the reason why this psalm is so popular at funerals. It talks about death and it also tells us why we should not fear death. And as we listen to God's word explained the Holy Spirit is going to open our hearts and minds to receiving the promise that verse 4 has for us. So to uh, frame our understanding of verse 4, uh, one thing that might stand out to us as we get into verse 4 is that it continues on this idea of leading and walking that has been developing throughout the psalm. In verse 2, it says, The Lord leads me beside still waters. And then in verse 3, He leads me in paths of righteousness. And now in verse 4, it is implied that the Lord is the one leading us through this valley of the shadow of death. And right there is a promise. If the Lord is leading us through this valley, it's obvious that he is the one who will lead us out of it. In fact, he will lead us out of it. So right here already is a promise for us that as the Lord leads us in this valley, he will bring us out of it. So the question is, what is this valley of the shadow of death? In the case of David, <clears throat> uh, who was the author of the psalm, the valley of the shadow of death may be a reference to that season in his life when he was being pursued and hunted by his enemies, especially his rebellious son, Absalom. In our case, the valley of the shadow of death refers to that moment or any moment in our lives when we feel closest to death. It could be the death of a loved one, a dear friend, it might even be our deaths. But since you and I never really know when our lives can be taken from us in this world, it's fair to say that the valley of the shadow of death covers our entire experience of life in a fallen world. The Holy Spirit wants us to see this world, our worldly existence, 
as a valley of death shadow. Why? Because in this world, we're always subjected to mortality. The moment we step out of the door on any given day, there is always a risk of injury. There is always the possibility of death. Uh, Jesus himself says, in this world, you will have tribulation. And not to make light of real bodily death or, or real injury, physical injury. We also experience death in lesser ways, don't we? We experience death, for instance, uh, when a relationship does not work out, or when our dreams, our plans are brought to a, a, uh, an end for one reason or another. Those are all little versions of death. Why? Because they all remind us, they all have a way of bringing us back to the awareness that we are dust and ashes, to use Abraham's phrase. And just as we cope with sin in all kinds of different ways, we also have our own ways of coping with the great shadow, don't we? I'm not going to be comprehensive here, but just to point out one major way that many of us cope with the reality of death is by trying to get out of this world as much as we can, living life to the fullest. And you know all the phrases that come in, right? Uh, uh, live life uh, to the best that you can. Uh, uh, be, the, the, be all that you can be. Seize the day, right? Those are some ways uh, that we cope with, with the awareness of death. And that's why some people have bucket lists. Uh, that is why we surround ourselves as much as we can with the good things in life. Uh, that is why we want all kinds of wonderful experiences and more money to have those experiences. In a way, those things keep us sane. They also keep the awareness of death. They are our attempts at keeping the awareness of death at a distance. But as you and I know, all it takes, again, is for something to remind us of death. Maybe a phone call, maybe something we read about in the news, and that shadow clouds our hearts again. We're brought back into that dark valley, and we remember how fragile we are. But what is God doing now as he gives you this psalm? As God brings Psalm 23 into your awareness, God is intervening in your mind at this moment. His word is like a blast of light that breaks the darkness. It's like a bolt of lightning that lights up the sky. And all of a sudden, we're able to see clearly again. We can see that we are being led through this valley by someone who knows what he is doing. You and I are not alone in this valley. We are being led through it by none other than the Good Shepherd himself. The Good Shepherd who is the Lord of heaven and earth, our Savior Jesus Christ. He has defeated our deaths. And he is now leading us through this valley to a new land, a new reality, where there are not going to be shadows anymore. It's going to be only light, only green pastures, only life. And when this awareness connects with our hearts, when, when, or, or when this word connects with uh, our hearts, uh, our minds, it draws out from us a confession of faith. We are able to say, I will fear no evil. I don't have to be afraid of anything any longer. Even though something bad could happen to me today, I'm not going to live in fear. I will fear no illness. I will fear no pestilence. I will fear no enemy. I will fear no demonic power. 
I will fear no opinion of man. I'm not going to be afraid when laws or politics change for the worse. I will not fear the loss even of my earthly hopes and dreams. I'm going to be okay even if I don't get the life that I want. And when the time comes for me to leave this world, I will go without regret. I will not be afraid to draw my final breath. Why? Why are we able to confess and say those things? It all comes down to this. You are with me. For you are with me. The entire song hangs on this promise. In fact, our entire lives as believers are grounded in this promise. The Good Shepherd himself, our King, Jesus the Messiah, is with us. He comes alongside us in this valley. He is the one who has died for our sins already. Therefore, our sins have been atoned for. We are forgiven. There is no more condemnation for us. And in addition to that, he is the one who has defeated our sin and death. And for those reasons, you and I are not going to be afraid anymore because the shadow no longer has power over us. <clears throat> to fill out this picture a little further, David adds this line. He says, Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now David, being a shepherd himself, knew what those tools meant for the sheep. In ancient shepherding, it was not uncommon for shepherds to have two rod-like instruments at their disposal in caring for the sheep. One was a rod and the other would be a staff. The rod was essentially a weapon. It was a club approximately two feet long and it would be used to beat and defend the sheep from any predators that might come. The staff would be a much longer rod with almost a, a, a hook at the end of it, shaped like a hook. And the shepherd would use the staff basically to manage the movement of the sheep, to uh, guide the sheep, pull them back if they wandered away. Uh, and, and, and also the shepherd would use the staff to pull down any leafy branches to feed the sheep. So both the rod and the staff were important instruments in preserving and providing for the sheep. They were positive symbols for the sheep. They, uh, they protected the sheep, which is why David finds comfort under the Lord's rod and staff. See, King David sees himself as a sheep of the divine shepherd. And just as he protected his own sheep when he was a shepherd, he trusts the Lord to protect him as well as his people. So we might ask, what is the Lord's rod and staff in our lives today? What functions as the Lord's rod and staff in our lives today? Well, given that we're talking here in, in terms of imagery and in, in symbolism and metaphor, uh, there's not just one thing that functions as the, the Lord's rod and staff, but ultimately the Lord's rod and staff are his kingdom, his rule over our lives, which he exercises by his word. Uh, in the ancient world, the rod and staff were also symbols of authority. Again, several uh, sermons ago, we talked about the fact that uh, rulers were also called shepherds. And it's interesting that the word for rod is also the word for scepter. So the Lord's rod and staff are ultimately a depiction of his rule over our lives, his kingship over his church. But once again, this is not a rule of a tyrant uh, who, who cares nothing for the sheep. This is the rule of a true king, a good king, who has already laid down his life for us to forgive our sins, 
So this is a rule that doesn't oppress. This is a rule that sets us free. Jesus has defeated our sin and our deaths. And he, like a rod, prevents those forces from having the final word over our lives. So what does it mean for the Lord's rod and staff to comfort us? Well, it means that our sin will not condemn us on the last day because this good shepherd has already answered for those sins on our behalf. Uh, he has given his life as an atonement and that atonement is perfect. It is complete. There's nothing more to be answered for. Justice has been completely served for you by uh, Christ himself, God's very own son. And since this rule has broken our enemies, defeated our enemies, this is also a rule that keeps us close to the shepherd. When we know that our Savior has died for our sins and that He is our life, this promise keeps us from running away. It prevents us from leaving the fold. Just as a shepherd uses his staff to pull his sheep back from harm, the Lord, using his word, pulls you back to himself. And this is exactly what happens every Lord's Day when we come to the worship service listening to the word. This is exactly what happens also when you read the word uh, in your own personal worship. The Lord uses his word and his spirit to pull you back from the brink of death, pull you back into the fold, keeping you in the faith. And as he does that, he causes us to find our righteousness in him. So what Psalm 23 verse 4 is showing us is the power of Christ's kingdom over our lives. This is the same promise that we find in Colossians chapter 1. And Colossians 1, Paul says, speaking about God, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Amazingly enough, you have been saved from the kingdom of death. You have been delivered from this valley. You have been set free from the power of death by God the Father in Jesus Christ himself. When the Lord raised Jesus from the dead, he pulled all of us out from the dead in Christ. He ripped us out of the clutches of death in the resurrected body of his son. And that is why even though you journey through this valley now in this life, our bodies are still subjected to the power of death in this life. Ultimately speaking, we're no longer here. We've been pulled out. We've been raised from the dead in our Lord Jesus Christ. And on the last day, our bodies will finally catch up with that reality when God himself summons us from the dead intact with our bodies to inherit an eternal kingdom. This is the promise of the Lord to you. Let's cling to it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and how your word, like a rod, defends us from our enemies and how your word, like your staff, pulls us back into the faith whenever we run away. Father, let your word dwell in our hearts and let your word keep us faithful to our Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom we pray. Amen. And now once again, receive the Lord's promise in this benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and your family.